and alive. Hello, everyone, and welcome to our OS Grid portion of the program. Our first speaker today is Justin Clark Casey. Justin Clark Casey is a professional consultant and developer of open source virtual 3D environment software. He has been a core developer on the Open Simulator project for more than six years, responsible for features such as Open Simulator archives and NPCs, as well as numerous bug fixes, release management, and general steering of the project. In this time, he has worked with numerous clients, including Intel Corporation, Sandia National Labs, 3D Avatar School, and McMaster University. Justin is also president of the Open Simulator Umbrella Overt Foundation and was co-chair of the 2013 Open Simulator Community Conference. Everyone, please help me welcome Justin Clark Casey. Right, well, uh, thanks everyone. I hope everybody can hear me. Um, I know we've got some sim issues today, unfortunately, but voice should remain fine. So we're going to press ahead. Um, and hopefully we can get some uh, Q&A at the end. Um, we'll have to see how it goes. Right. So thanks very much to uh, Letty for that great introduction. Um, so uh, when a teacher finally, um, very kindly came and asked me to do this talk, I said to her, well, what is the theme? And she said, well, the theme of the conference this year is connections. So I, I thought about this, and really when I think about this, the whole idea of connections does go to the core of why I do what I do. So what do I mean by that? Well, I'm just kind of go through some, some personal history here. So I haven't always been working in this kind of crazy uh, open source way in, 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 in this kind of space. I used to work um, for seven years actually for IBM in the UK. So I had, a, uh, I had a, a kind of very normal schedule. So I would kind of get up in the morning, um, not, uh, well, have a shower, not have breakfast, because I could never really be bothered to have breakfast. And I'd have a 20-minute commute to IBM UK, which was, uh, which was in Hursley, and it kind of had a country house and, and some surrounding office buildings and all the rest of it. Um, so I would go there, uh, go into my little office, which was a, a two-person office. The whole building was kind of embedded in the ground, so there's a huge grass bank outside, so you didn't really get a lot of light, although it's still better than having an office with no, with no windows. So I, I kind of went to this office, and I'd speak to my, uh, the project manager who I shared the office with during the day, and maybe a few other developers on whatever project we were working on, and, and, uh, and maybe a few other people around the site, like, um, like say, the... Um, the people who worked in the cafeteria or the librarian, people like that. But really, um, the kind of the number of people and, and the connections I made were was kind of very small. I might occasionally talk to people in the in the US or uh, or in India, other IBM employees, but that'd be quite rare because that was done through the management or the or the kind of the architects. Um, and I would certainly never meet customers. Uh, I think I met one once. Um, as part of a part of a group, and uh, I, yeah, I gave a presentation down. I don't think that was the best presentation ever, but but that would be kind of like the the one time in seven years I actually met somebody outside the organisation in my capacity at IBM as a, as a software developer. So I was kind of like I was really bored by this point. I was thinking, well, do I want to go into academia? Do I do I want to do something else, or uh, do I want to do another project? And I'm not a great kind of writer or stuff, so uh, I really prefer to program. So. I was looking for another project to do, and I'd, I'd done a little bit on this strange thing called Second Life. Um, and that was interesting, but it wasn't really kind of fundamental enough for me. So uh, instead, I, uh, instead, I kind of started looking at this thing called OpenSim, which uh, IBM was involved with at the time. This was back in uh, 2007, when, of course, there was this huge um, interest in, in Second Life and, and IBM and all kinds of corporate um, companies had, had a very keen interest in it as a, as a, as a tool for doing all kinds of things, and, and along with a lot of other people, as, as many of you probably remember. So I was looking at this, and, and, and I was getting really interested in this project, so I kind of started, in, in, it was an open source project, so I started 
submitting patches to it with the cooperation of IBM because I had one of these contracts where IBM owns everything you do, which is was incredibly annoying. But uh, as they were part of this um, OpenSim project, I could submit patches and start to get involved. And so I got involved with talking to developers and, of course, working with people on the project that way. But, but of course, it's not only developers. It is also all the people who are surrounding the community, all the people in the community who, who are interested, who are helping with it in, in terms of actually using it or, or testing it or providing feedback. But of course, it wasn't only those people. Um, it's also people, I started to meet people in the wider world, both in terms of being in Second Life a bit and in OpenSim and in, in terms of just getting to know people. So, I, you know, talking to, um, talking to uh, an advertising person from Spain um, talking to uh, fashion designers, talking to other academics. Suddenly, there was this whole world of people who I'd never, ever talked to um, doing what I was previously doing. And I ended up working for one of these people. So uh, the fashion designer, in, in fact, I ended up working with her uh, on a project for one. And so when she offered me the job, um, me being the thing that I can't deal with at all well is boredom. If I'm bored of something, I, I kind of... I can't do it anymore. I don't have any sense of realism about a job or a career or anything. I just kind of, like, if I get bored, that's the, that's the thing. So I was quite happy to go off and work with this person who I'd never met. I'd have any other interactive with over the internet. And I still haven't met and I never will, in all probability. And, and this kind of led to working with other companies, working with, uh, with Intel and Sandy and Ashton Labs and, and the people that Letty mentioned in the introduction. And again, the vast majority of these people I've never physically met. I've only, I've only ever met one of my clients, I think. Um, so this was, uh, of course, this is interesting, but of course, this is only, this is only part of it. The whole, uh, the whole thing of uh, being in this space is that you, you start to meet other people and you start to have serendipitous kind of connections with them. All these people I, I described meeting, and I'm sure many of you have had the same experience, are again people who... I'm meeting just because I'm in this environment. I have no previous kind of arrangement to meet them or, or meetings or that, or that kind of stuff. It's kind of this whole hallway conversation or just being able to kind of meet people in a real space. So that was interesting. And of course, the whole thing of maintaining connections with people. I, I, and it is also part of the fact that I work in this space now, but a, quite a, a lot of people over the six years I've been doing this. And, and we are a small community, but nonetheless, we are a very interesting and, and, and solid community. And, and these kind of environments, I think, help people maintain connections with each other by seeing people in spaces like this, for instance, uh, people where, where many of us don't ever meet physically. So I kind of find this trend really interesting. Uh, it's gone from being just people I could meet in my own particular environment to, to a situation where now I can meet and collaborate with people all over the world. And so everything is, is slowly going online. And we're, not, we're certainly not alone in this in, in terms of our space and virtual environments, in terms of what we do here. Um, things like online gaming, for instance, the, the World of Warcraft, the EVE Online, they have uh, ebbed and flowed a little bit, but they're still enormously popular and, and more interesting experiences are coming along all the time. And of course, there's the huge growth of social media, which you know exponentially dwarfs what's been happening here. Um, the, the, the massive amounts of money that people pump into this stuff and come up with new applications all the time. And this is people, again, connecting online uh, in a very large part. But then we also see kind of culture emerging. So I'm always very interested in Reddit for instance, which people may be familiar with, is kind of a social, um, a social site for discussing of all kinds of different things. But not only is it discussion of real-world events, but I think culture really starts to emerge from there. It might not be very highbrow culture in terms of being memes and, uh, and other kinds of stuff like that, but nevertheless, it's culture. And finally, uh, as I think many of you, uh, if you're educators here, are, are familiar with the trend towards massive open online conferences, sorry, courses rather, massive open online courses where you're trying to suddenly reach people and teach people all around the world and have these new ways of organizing education, um, which just weren't possible before. And, and more and more increasingly, things are happening online. So this brings me to my first thesis, which is a rather grand name for this kind of stuff. And I hope the slide, uh, right, the slide unfortunately is not 
advancing or probably advanced in about 60 seconds or something. Um, we are having a few issues here today, as you can tell. But my first thesis um, is that all these things that I just talked about, work, play, culture, education, the nexus of all of these things is going to be online in the future. So this isn't a, I, in some ways, I don't think this is a particularly controversial statement, certainly not to the, the audience here. We've seen this trend uh, uh, come along with the growth of the internet, with all these things, with, with what we're doing here, with online gaming, with social media. And I think this is only going to continue. So I'm sure many of you can kind of think of the reasons why I, I kind of think that, but I'm just going to go through a few of them. So. First of all, this, this kind of thing is enormously more convenient. I have to confess that I am uh, I'm an awfully lazy person. <laughs> and if I don't need to go and do something, I won't, partly because I'm already always under time pressure, it seems, from other things, but also I do like doing nothing for, for quite long, uh, kind of disturbing amounts of time. So if there's a way I can start to kind of work online without having to do even a 20-minute commute is kind of annoying to me. And I know that's kind of tiny compared to many people, but... Even that is kind of like wasted time to me. So if I can, if I can just do these things purely online, if I can contact people that way, then, then that's an enormous thing. I, I don't think, I mean, there are people who are definitely more, less lazy than I am, but nonetheless, I think it's a, it is a very real thing that people want to do things in this way. But of course, that's just one factor. So I think also, certainly in terms of creation, suddenly online, you have a massive pool of collaborators, other people you can work with for contact who, you would never work with necessarily in, in the real world. I know in education, you have all these conferences, for instance. I know you guys go back and forth um, to kind of uh, different, uh, different conferences in the world and, and, and cooperate with people. But nonetheless, you're restricted by the kind of people you can meet locally and the kind of people you can communicate and, and establish a rapport with elsewhere. And that's not always easy. So, but, in, but instead, with the internet, we have this massive pool of collaborators that, that is the way you know going back to that a bit that people do look for look to uh, communicate with other people and, and already do contact with other people and collaborate with people online so that i think is only going to accelerate both in terms of just contacting and communicating and also in terms of actually collaborating directly online as we see in environments like the one we have here for instance where you can uh, problems notwithstanding you can collaborate and build things. And finally, when you can kind of communicate with all these people online, suddenly there's a massive pool of expertise you can interact with. Again, you're not restricted to the experts or the people you have locally. Instead, you can communicate and cooperate with people all around the world who are, who are experts in the particular thing that they do. And this kind of comes, goes into all, again, the creative mediums. I, if you're doing, if you're trying to build something, you do want to kind of be able to contact and, and work with the best there is. So unfortunately, we still don't have the slide, but the, the kind of word I, I used on there was uh, nexus. The, uh, we're, gonna, we're looking for uh, the nexus of all of these being online. And I use that word because to me, it, is, it implies connections, the act of binding people together. And really, I think everything we do is, is, is facilitated by these connections. So in online gaming, you, you, you kind of connect with people in a guild, for instance. So in social media, you, you have people that you talk with more than others. You, you have your uh, uh, different friends or different sets of uh, Twitter followers and, and people you follow. And so really, the, the facilitation of all these acts, work, education, culture, is facilitated around building connections with people, whether they're with um, colleagues or potential collaborators, students or, or customers. So I think it's critical to, uh, to, actually get, uh, to actually be able to build these things out in the future. So the question to me then is, how is this stuff going to happen? Why, for instance, isn't, is social media going to be enough? Because, of course, social media is a hugely popular thing right now. It gets uh, a huge amount of money pumped into it. It's already a giant industry. Why isn't that going to be the thing that really facilitates these connections, that really brings us to this point where everything does happen online. And, in, and compared with, with the niche of virtual environments, it's absolutely huge. Um, 
So this brings me on to my second thesis. Oh, I got thesis one then. Ah, uh, the click worked, but not the second one. Okay. If I click too many times, it'll go hugely back and forth through the slides, which, which probably won't be great. Um, I'll do it anyway. Um, so this kind of brings me on to what I've got a grammy called thesis number two, which is that to actually form these greater connections, we need, oh, there we go. Um, to form these greater connections, we need immersive places. So I, I find my own case an interesting example of this stuff. So open source projects already have a long history of cooperation with people very rarely meeting in the physical world. Um, any number of these things, Apache, Linux, are, are great examples where a huge amount of the cooperation happens online and really through means which are very narrow band, if you like, mailing lists or IRC, purely text-only forms. But I find it interesting, very interesting, that people still want to meet in the physical world, and these the physical world meetings still play a crucial role in establishing, I think, connections between people. So, for instance, you know, of course, the, the any kind of large open source project has a convention, and all these conventions, for the most part, are in the physical world. So, Linux has, you know, any number of conventions, and open source has any number of general physical cooperations, um, physical conventions where people get together and meet each other. And in this physical world um, serves as a general purpose environment. So you go there and you're able to, uh, people can see your body language, they, they can hear your tone of voice. You can get all this communication that you simply don't get with text and, and don't really get in the virtual world either at the moment, I, I, I freely admit. And it's these kinds of things that help people build greater connections. And of course, the physical world also acts as a collaborative medium, the ultimate collaborative medium, if you like, where people can actually go, you know, it's kind of like a, a strange, trivial point to make, of course, but of course you can do anything in the physical world. That's ultimately where everything happens at the moment. That's our base reality where, where stuff, you know, where collaboration can really get done for a very large part in, in a very, of course, a huge, reality is a huge high bandwidth environment, if you like. Um, where people can do stuff. Um, uh, but none of this stuff, it's the thing is people are still meeting physically. There are things like Google Hangouts, for instance, and, and all kinds of stuff, but, and, and video conferencing, but I don't think they meet the need for people to actually establish both co established connections, whether that's through organized meetings like this or purely serendipity, and actually to maintain those connections and actually to do the kind of collaboration which I think is essential for us in the future. So that's why I think immersive environments are going to be immensely important. Um, we are at a, a, a very low level at the moment, I think. Um, for instance, we're having problems here today with OpenSim, and, and it's kind of like uh, unfortunate, but these things do happen from time to time. But of course, software is going to get better as we go on. Um, and we do need to have a much more immersive in-world. The, the kind of move recently by Facebook to buy the Oculus Rift has been, of course, enormously interesting to many of us in this field, and I'm sure to many of you, because it suggests that they do really see this kind of stuff. Maybe not, I won't say this kind of stuff exactly, but they are getting towards an idea of, of an actual immersive environment being very, a very highly important thing for kind of, in their case, of course, the social media side of things. But I would say also, of course, in our case, in terms of collaboration and other kinds of factors. And, and it's interesting, it's very interesting that they're making those kinds of investments. Um, but of course, things do need to be improved. We need to have a great sense of immersion in the world, whether that's through things like the Oculus Drift, but also I think things like actually transmitting body language within the world. So um, it was very unfortunate I wasn't able to get to Philip's talk the other day, but I understand he's working on that kind of stuff, actually being able to, to really present a sense of oneself in the world in, in the fact that, in the fact that I, uh, I, you know, if I make a, a body gesture now, I know that won't happen today because we are having issues, although it's kind of impressive almost that the sim hasn't completely crashed at this point. I think there's, I know, I think I know where the, issues, the area where the issues lay. But anyway, let me, I won't get back, um, I won't get off the track on that. 
but what I'd like, what I'd love to see is if I make a, a hand gesture like I just have in the physical world, that it gets transmitted into the virtual world, and you really do see me in a very real sense as my avatar make those hand gestures. So I think there's a there's a huge scope for actually improving immersion. Right? It's not going to be simple, and it's certainly not going to be cheap to do. Um, although, of course, the facilities for doing it do need to get cheaper, but I think there's an enormous scope for increasing the way that we can transmit this data, this information about what I'm doing within Worlds. So that kind of brings me on to my third thesis, which is actually the one that did get on the, the slides because I clicked a, a couple of times in the end. So I think that if you accept that things are going to move online, and you accept that online we need immersive places because we need greater connections, we need greater collaborative facilities. Then the third thesis, which is a bit, bit more contentious, is that I think these immersive places ultimately need to be free. So in one sense, this is it's not really this is not the thrust, but it is about cost. I firmly believe that innovation is evenly distributed throughout the population. So by that, I mean anybody can and does innovate, whether they're already in a large company, whether they're in charge of making these billion dollar acquisitions and, uh, and deciding what a group of people do, or whether they're right at the other end, whether they're, whether they're individuals in an organization doing their own thing or whether they're hobbyists, they have just as much capacity to innovate and do valuable innovation. And I would argue, in many cases more so because they're really at the cold face of, of knowing the miniature of what's necessary to get around certain problems they have and to do certain stuff. But I think, I firmly believe that innovation is entirely distributed throughout anybody, no matter what educational standard they've achieved, they've, they've got to or, or what job they have. And to me, this is why it's really important that these environments are cheap and accessible because the cheaper you make it, the easier it is for people who don't have huge resources to actually innovate. So whether that's uh, just being able to have a cheap, least virtual environment, or if they've got the technical ability, and you know, this is where other kinds of costs come in, but if they've got the technical ability to set up their own systems or, uh, and set up large, large systems, whether they have access to hardware, but not other kinds of money, and they can do interesting stuff with much larger environments, I think it's really important that these things are cheap. And that's a big challenge. So, for, for instance, Linden Lab, um, we all know that the, uh, the region charges that they have, and you can make all kinds of comparisons. And I, I think it's interesting that they haven't increased, for instance. Inflation is slowly eroding away the cost of doing that. But nonetheless, they, it, is a, it is a pretty large amount of money, I still think, each month to actually have your own region, for instance, if that's the level you want to get to. And I kind of understand why they go down that route because that's a business model that works. It's enormously difficult to, to create and sustain a company. I, I do have a huge amount of admiration for what they've done. Um, but these things are not cheap. You need a business model to sustain what you're doing. So I can understand why they charge this amount of money, but at the same time, it does act as a barrier, I think, for innovation in this space. But I, I'm really by free, I'm talking in a, in a more fundamental sense. Excuse me a second. Really, I'm talking in a more fundamental sense in, in, in terms of freedom, of things being free in the same way that the web is free. So this implies a number of things. So on the web, we know that no one organization is in control of everything. Instead, there's a bunch of competing and cooperating both open source and proprietary projects, which nonetheless kind of take part in this distributed system where there's no single company controlling everything. Maybe you could argue DNS is a bit of an area of control, but for the most part, there is no central control. Um, so whether that's kind of like servers like Apache or Nginx or whether that's web browsers like, uh, well, I, they used to be more proprietary and nowadays you have Firefox and Chrome and still things like Internet Explorer, but also other kind of things built on top of that, both open source in terms of things like WordPress and, um, 
and Drupal and other kinds of CMS, or whether that's proprietary like Twitter and Facebook, although they still use an, an enormous amount of open source code underneath and make contributions to open source projects. So to me, that's kind of critical for virtual worlds. And it's really not what we have at the moment. At the moment, we have, uh, in many cases, a, a large number of, well, I won't say large, we have a number of different virtual environments, and they're all pretty much controlled by one company. So Linda Lab being, of course, the major example, they control the services, they control the simulators, they don't let anybody else, anybody else directly onto the network. You can't you know, go from one region to another unless it's hosted by them. So you're kind of ceding a certain amount of control to those companies. And, and that's, you know, even traditional open sim is the same. It acts on much the same architecture as a central set of services and a central set of simulators. And they're all controlled by the same organization. And there's very, actually very good reasons for that. Um, but nonetheless, it is kind of like a structure where a single entity is in charge of everything. And to come back to the web, in, in some cases, this really, this really works. You can say, well, you know, Justin, um, there are huge properties out there, the Twitter uh, and the, twi the Twitters and the Facebooks. Um, yeah, you have the twi um, Twitter and Facebook out there and they're all, you know, they're, they're single companies. They're, they are using a lot of open source, but at the same time, they're, they're collecting data. They're, they're, they're in control of that data. Twitter controls who can see the fire hose or tweets. Facebook controls who can start to use their data and advertise on their platform. And we've seen efforts to try and dislodge that, like, for instance, Diaspora uh, as an alternative free uh, open social network, which have not managed to take off at all. They're, they are still around, but you know they've not had any kinds of success in terms of dislodging the system, the central systems like Facebook. So I think you can you can definitely make the criticism. Well, why why do think, why why do virtual environments need to be like the web? Why uh, why why couldn't another company come along? Whether maybe that's a rejuvenated Linden Lab or or maybe another company and come along with a much better virtual environment, learn the mistakes that have been made here, and come along with something which is so much better than what we have at the moment. But I don't think that's the future. Maybe not surprisingly, considering who I am. Um, I see virtual environments as a much more fundamental layer of a future kind of distributed system than your Twitters and your Facebook nowadays. And why do I see it as a more fundamental layer? Well, why do I see it more as, a, as an HTTP layer than an application on top? Well, there's a, there's a set of reasons for that. Um, the first of those is complexity. So there's all kinds of complexities in these systems. I mean, even doing a simulator in itself, forget about any kind of distributed stuff. Just a simulator in itself is an enormously complex undertaking. Uh, for instance, as you know here, we're far from perfect in terms of what we do here. Um, there's all kinds of technical layers that these systems are sitting upon. Um, and to do that is is enormously complex. You have to uh, have a have a physics environment. Physics itself is a is another really complex system. Uh, you know, it's difficult enough in game systems, let alone a general purpose virtual environment like this, where anybody can do all kinds of interesting physical objects, which you don't expect to find in your kind of highly optimized and tuned game. But also, there's things like the scripting engine. We all know that in OpenSIM, the scripting engine is is functional, but there are ways you can tie up it. It is primitive in other respects, and you know this is not because nobody has thought about the problem, but because it is really complex to do a, a fair scripting engine. I mean, this is, these are still matters almost of research, I would say. And that again is a world of complexity until itself, and and other kinds of aspects of the system, like distributing avatar movements and other object movements and messages and all the rest of it. And it's not just on the server side that it's complex. It's also complex on the viewer side, of course. The viewer projects are really, you know, much larger than the simulator. They're, I think, in terms of lines of code, they're double the size of, of OpenSIM. And, and they have to do all kinds of really complex things in terms of, uh, of uh, displaying graphics and graphical fidelity. And, and of course, one really wants to be beyond where we are now. And that is not an easy problem to solve. That's continually pushing at the boundaries, both of graphics 
in and of themselves and in terms of what you can do in a general environment where you're streaming down content and you can't predict what you're going to get next. Um, so these are really complicated problems. And also the fact that we have applications on top of these systems. I'm sure many of you, uh, if your educators have experimented with different ways of going about being able to use virtual worlds in education, whether that's in, in terms of uh, just straight teaching environments. Uh, so for instance, when I worked with the 3D avatar, so one of the startups I worked with was 3D avatar school who were doing, doing education in terms of using OpenSim to do English language learning. And so they had designed a number of environments. So that was not that was not a thing where the kids or the children were actually building. This was where a lesson was just being delivered in an environment with a, with a set of mini games in it. And the interesting thing is there, they could um, they could actually have people come in, for instance, from the, the ultimate plan was to have people come in from the Philippines and connect purely remotely, but also be teaching a class, an English class in China and using this environment as the remote teaching tool. But that's only one application of this. There are kinds of applications like, for instance, the meeting we're having here both all the meetings that have been happening in Second Life and in here and the conference we did last year and in terms of collaboration and in terms of actually building things and I think there's some very interesting things if we can get 3D printing working from these environments and another factor is actually being able to get richer editing tools for editing mesh I think there are interesting experiments happening on the web and I don't see why those can't migrate to actual in-world viewers but in terms of actually collaborating and cooperating with these environments in a system of, of making connections and cooperating with people. So there's all these applications that go on top of these systems. They're not like, I, I know there are, there are kind of apps on Facebook, but they're not hugely rich apps. They're mainly things which, you know, use Facebook as a social layer, I think. And Twitter, again, you know, you do have apps there, but they're not, they're not hugely, I wouldn't say they're, they're hugely rich apps in the sense that I'm talking about them. So a third reason why I see virtual environments as a fundamental layer is that I think there's a real winner takes all thing that can happen here. So this is very much in terms of content sharing. Uh, so if I, and it ties into identity, but let me take the content sharing first. If I create an object in world, in this world, and I want to share it with somebody else, that's kind of easy if they're running, again, another, in this case, another open sim system. And I think it's interesting that we're seeing the emergence of kind of open marketplaces uh, elsewhere. I won't, I won't name any names in the interest of being neutral, but we are seeing the emergence of open marketplaces to match those which already exist, say the Second Life marketplace, for instance, or things like the Unity Assets Store, marketplaces which already exist in one particular system, but instead we see the emergence of open marketplaces. And I think this really speaks to the idea or that I have that con that winner takes all in terms of these systems. So, so for instance, we're meeting here in OpenSim and I know a lot of the uh, conference goes on in Second Life. And this is, this is something where, which, and this might sound rather harsh, but this tends to shut out other competing systems. If it's difficult, it's kind of an awkward thing for somebody to come along to, to one system like this, for instance, and start wanting to talk about an alternative virtual environment system because they can't make use of the fact that they can travel in other places here or actually already share existing content. Instead, it's it's kind of another system. So I, I think those things tend to be winner takes all, just like there's one single HTTP web-like system and set of standards. In the same way, I think this kind of stuff will tend towards one single set of standards here. And, and there's no doubt there's an enormous distance to go with this stuff. The, I could say standards in terms of open sim, but that's to kind of like uh, polish the, you know, <laughs> I won't say it that way, but it, it's kind of like to to uh, to give things a, uh, uh oh, um, so I may have been disconnected in world, um, but I might still be on voice. Um, let me just check that in a minute. So I'm just going to uh, see if I'm still on voice or whether I've been cut off. Okay, I'm still on Skype, of course. Um, how do you want to... Uh, okay, am I still doing in-world voice or how do you want to proceed? I can try and re-log, but I'm not sure how successful that's going to be. Okay, I think I'm just going to continue on voice here. Okay, I'm going to carry on. So, and, and I think the same comes true of identity. Um, if you establish a presence of one virtual system, 
it's a real problem to go and then use another virtual system um, because you, you suddenly need to set up all your identity again. And, and this is annoying enough with websites um, where you have to do this. And, and this problem is very slowly being solved. But that's almost just sharing a very few bits of information, your email perhaps and your name and a little bit more. But that's nowhere near the amount of information you're trying to share if you're trying to share your appearance and identity and your even your inventory. So this is where uh, I kind of like talk uh, a little bit about the hypergrid. So of course, many of you here or were here would have been familiar with the hypergrid because I know you've come over this. But that's a hugely interesting system because it suddenly is one where in this case, anybody can go and set up an open SIM system entirely independently of other people. They don't need to ask permission or be part of some bigger system. Um, but it's still a way for them to go between these different systems. So, I, for instance, if one logs into OS Grid, because that is hypergrid enabled, and if there's another hypergrid enabled like the Jocadia Grid, which I think people are going to be visiting later today, even though there's those entirely independent systems, if one has a hypergrid address, one can move between them. And suddenly that opens up the way for a web-like system to be of more anarchic growth and cooperation between many different sets of people in terms of evolving these systems. Um, so I think that's a real way forward. Um, and it kind of like, it kind of speaks to being able to preserve content and identity because I mean, it's easy at the moment because many people are using, in this case, OpenSIM for this. But I think the ultimate is you have to have open standards and, and that's going to be a slow evolution. But once you have that, people can set up their own systems and they can start to innovate and they don't need permission <clears throat> instead. Excuse me a second. Instead, everything is much more web-like. And I think this is going to be critical in order to do the huge amount of work needed to actually establish these environments. I don't think it, I don't think it's, I think it's simply not possible for it to be done by one single company. Um, certainly not the companies that are in place at the moment. I think there has to be a cooperation and an open source ecosystem between many different players where no single company is going to own any part of the stack, as they say in, in IBM parlance. It has to be an open source ecosystem. And I think we've got a huge way to go. I mean, as we've seen, we've we've kind of crashed on OpenSIM today and 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 the environments are still kind of very, very much in their early stages. When it works, it actually works really well. But when it crashes, it, it, it you know, it crashes because of certain aspects of the system. So there's no doubt in my mind that there's a huge distance to go because all these problems are really complicated. But I think of it as a marathon rather than a sprint. If we can establish a culture, a set of connections between people who really want to push this stuff forward, then that is more powerful than any single company in the long run. And we can make kind of improvements as we go along. If we can somehow keep building the aircraft as we're trying to fly it, as we've been doing really for the past six years, um, and it's proved sustainable for those past six years, then we can actually start to improve reliability and push at the boundaries of what's possible and start to get those kind of more formalized and work out well what works and what doesn't. And all you people are really critical for that because you are the guys. I mean, I can talk at the technical level but you're the guys actually doing the, the absolutely critical experimentation with these environments, trying to find out what are they good for? What really works? What do we need to improve? Um, and that kind of stuff is really critical and we need as many people doing that as possible. And that comes back to the earlier low cost point that we need people who can set up these environments at low cost or, or hire them or, or have, to have, have access to them at low cost. And, and both in terms of low monetary cost, but also arguably low technical cost, although these are always going to be for a very long period, really complicated systems to run. But if we can do that and get an open ecosystem, then I think we can really get a powerful engine of growth and experimentation towards the future and really creating and developing the metaverse as time goes on. So just to go back quickly among my kind of thesis, the first is that things are going to move and inevitably to me move online no matter what happens it's just there's too many factors that really make that a hugely valuable thing to do but also i think that to facilitate that higher immersion is going to be pushed we have entered the law you know back in 2007 there was an enormous amount of interest in these environments and that really died back i mean for instance ibm are no longer involved in any meaningful way in virtual environments although other companies like still are um, but there's been a dive bank. But I think, and I can say this because there, there have been kind of bubbles 
the, the stuff before there was VRML back in the late 90s and a lot of kind of virtual uh, gear um, coming back then and, and of course all these interesting movies like The Old Man and all that kind of stuff but I think now there is a real opportunity and, and I think it's going to be critical to actually have more immersive places and I think there's going to be another real push to do that kind of stuff because I think it's essential for greater connections and greater collaboration but that kind of comes back to my third and final thesis which that is that ultimately these places need to be both low cost but they also need to be part of an open ecosystem where anybody can set up their own server and take part in these systems and i and i think solutions need to be found in a greater sense for people to make money and to be able to have livelihoods on these systems i, I have no you know i'm an open source person but i need i am not independently wealthy i need to have you know be consulting or, or to rely on kind of the donations from people to actually keep working on this stuff and I've been able to do that for the past six years and I don't see why that can't continue in the future so if we can have and not only me I mean you know it's not enough one person to be able to do this at all we need more person not only programmers but also people who create content to be able to ha uh, sustainably work in this space and that's why I think open marketplaces are enormously interesting so I think there needs to be an open ecosystem where a large number of players can take part because that's the only way we're going to build what we need and to be able to do the innovation experimentation that we also need to advance these environments and get to the future and get to the future metaverse. So thank you very much. Um, I hope that was interesting to people. Uh, I hope I didn't go too fast. I probably did go quite fast because I, I, even though I've got a big speak slowly, banner in front of me i think i did still speak quite quickly but i hope that was okay for people and uh, i think i don't know how we could uh take q a uh now um is there a chat room i'm just looking at some of the um some of the twitter conversation mal if uh is there a way uh we can get questions in uh yes i can get the questions from in world for you justin um if they type them in in text chat okay. and then I'll just feed them to you on Skype. Are people back in the region? Because I can actually try and re-log on there. OK. OK, let me do that. Um, OK, so um, so I don't know if you heard. Yeah, I'm sure if you're listening to Skype, you heard that. But I'm just going to try and get it back into world now. And then see if uh, we can take some questions from the chat. Okay, so I've made it back in world now. So obviously I'm still, okay, it's interesting. Okay, we have a question for you, Justin. Okay. Um, Philippe asked, um, I asked Philip uh, this yesterday, do you see the biggest barrier to metaverse adoption to be the technical challenges or the social cultural challenges? Now that's, a, that's a really interesting question, I have to say. Um, that's very interesting because my my first kind of instinct as somebody who works in the cold, cold, um, cold place and really does get, you know, when, when something crashes like this, I, um, this is why I always try and think of it as a marathon. I know these kinds of problems are going to occur, um, especially in software where, and this is, I mean, this is the argument of a professional sort of developers, you can enforce discipline, you can have very predictable environments, uh, you don't get these kinds of problems. But at the same time, if you want an open system, you've got to tackle the much harder problems of being able to deal with these issues and actually get stable software over time. Um, so my instinct is always to say, well, technical. I know what the technical problems are. I see them day to day. I work on them day in, day out. I've been doing it for the past six years, which always amazes me. Um, so I know the issues there. So I, I think technical challenges are very real. But social cultural is, is very interesting because I think we see this stuff I mean, I can say, yeah, Philip would say technical. And I, I kind of would, hmm, that's really interesting. You see, part of me really does want to just straight out agree that technical, because I, I, I expect he's thinking of it in terms of all the interesting cutting edge stuff that he's pushing against in terms of actually getting, I think, better, a sense, better sense of avatars in the world. Um, but I would say cultural is actually really critical as well, because things like 
for instance, content creation. I mean, there's a big we we see this with copy bot, the copy bot discussions on on the Linda Lab grid. There's a there's a huge dislike of that kind of content content sharing. And I know in OpenSim, I don't think there's some huge raft of people always stealing stuff in OpenSim, but I do understand the fear that if you're in an open system where there's no central control, then then how do you actually make money from this stuff? How does it become worthwhile? How do you stop people stealing stuff? And I think those are also huge cultural challenges. And I don't think we have the answers. I think the answers are going to be similar to the music industry, movie and music industry, where you have to make it easy for people to get content and make it easy for them to pay you. But that's a personal point of view, but I think those are those are real challenges as well. So if I actually read out some of the other questions just to save time here. So I'm just going to take the next question from the chat quickly. So Dapichi says, how do you see the increasing trend to buy tablets rather than lap or desktop could keep people away of knowing of and uh, experimenting with immersive environments? Now that is also a very interesting question. Because um, yeah, it's a very real trend. I mean, um, I got my first, I'm not a huge tablet user, but and I, this is going to sound awfully primitive. I got my first smartphone recently. I'm, I'm kind of a big utilitarian. I don't tend to get hardware until I actually need it. Um, so I was using a, 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 a flip phone until about a month ago, well, three weeks ago. And then I suddenly got the Samsung S4 and it's pretty, it is pretty damn good. Um, I haven't tried the uh, the new Maya or the, or the viewers yet, but I, I certainly will when I get the, the, the opportunity. But no, that's, that's a real good question. I, I And I don't know the answer. Um, I think it's interesting. So a company called Simudyne, who people might have seen at the OpenSim conference, had kind of the viewer running on on a um, on a Windows based tablet, and they were, they actually had some innovative things where you could turn the tablet around and actually change your viewpoint in the virtual world. So you were holding up a window almost. It's kind of a bit like augmented reality in reverse. You're holding up a window to the virtual world and actually turning with that. So I think there is actual there is actual big scope for innovation there, and I think as these things get more powerful. I think there's going to be a factor, but you're right. I, I don't know how this works with smaller screens like phones, for instance, and maybe that's because I haven't really played around with it, but I think it's going to be an interesting question as to how that develops. But I think also, I think the trend, if I'm right, the trend towards immersive environments will actually push people towards solving these problems on a hardware level. I mean, if people want to take part in these things, you have to be able to do it. And whether that's through lighter, lighter headsets, kind of Oculus Rift stuff that isn't quite so Borg-like, whether that's for other systems, I, I think there's, going to be a lot of experimentation. Um, yes, uh, all kinds of mixing. So just to take Ariel's question, I think we've got transferred into the chat. Um, let me just find it amongst quickly reading the questions here. Oh yeah, Ariel, oh, from the live stream, in fact. So any chance of developing puppeteering on OpenSim? Now, this is where you get into the interesting area of an open source project. So. On an open source project, unlike, and I'm sure many of you know this, unlike a proprietary project, you can't go and tell people to do things. You you kind of, you can, well, you, when I say tell, you can negotiate with people, you can get agreement with people, you can you can get a plan, you can get everybody to, to agree to that plan, you can negotiate, but you can't tell. So to a large extent, but OpenSim is a pretty open project. There are certain things we restrict for, for various kinds of reasons I won't go into, but in the main, I think we're keen to take on new capabilities. So if somebody was to do puppeteering, and I think, and just to come back to what I was saying earlier, I think actually that's really going to be important because if I want to transfer a gesture I'm making uh, in front of my computer here to in-world, we need puppeteering. We need a, a facility to move my arm in response. And that is, to me, that's what I understand as one of the things to be puppeteering. So actually, I think it is really important. I would love, I would love to see a system in OpenSim to do that. Um, but of course, it's a question of somebody either paying for it in some way or having the interest. And people do pay for things. I, um, you know, I've done on a very low level. I've, the, all the consulting projects I've done, I've always had the stipulation that the code can go back into OpenSim. Anything that relates to OpenSim goes back into OpenSim because I think that's critically important. I think it's both in actually a company's best interests, and of course, it's in our best interest to have that kind of cooperation. So, if so, so somebody may pay for this, but also that doesn't restrict somebody who's really interested in this stuff, working out a system. I think it's a complicated problem because it's one of these things where you have to have both server side and viewer side cooperation to do this stuff, to actually get a puppeteering system in place. But if somebody were to do it, I, I we would be very happy in the OpenSim project to accept those patches and to accept that code. I, I, I think it would be enormously fantastic thing to do. And I think we can get 
cooperation. We've seen that with the variable region stuff where there had to be, so variable regions for anybody who doesn't know is, is kind of like an up and coming feature. And, and Aurora, so I, will, I will give props where props is due because Aurora Sim did a lot of the early experimentation with this stuff, which is Aurora Sim being a, a fork of OpenSim. Um, so they did a lot of the work on that, um, on variable regions, which is the ability to not only have 256 by 256 regions, but to have much larger regions which don't have region crossings. Um, and Robert Adams um, has done a lot of work on this recently in, in getting this working, and, and I have been very impressed by how well it does work. Um, but that required changes on the viewer side because, of course, Second Life does not support that kind of thing. I mean, I should say Linda Lab does not support that kind of thing natively. And so there had to be changes. And that was a cooperation between the server applied people and, and viewer side people. So it is possible. Um, so M. Jannings, uh, I don't know how, I know we're up to the hour here. Um, I'm going to assume I'm going to keep going for a bit. Um, unless there's another event, if there's, sorry, um, go on. Yeah, go ahead. Yeah, go ahead and answer those two questions on the on the chat and then we can we can wrap up. Okay, I'm going to answer the uh, M and Casey's um, uh, questions quickly. Uh, so to answer M, so M's questions is um, there was a project to develop a distributed system for immersive environments called Open Cobalt. Have you heard of it, and do you know what happened to the project? So yes, I very much have heard of it. It's one of the things I'm I'm always interested in other approaches to this problem, um, the distributed system problem. So I, I I looked at it. I ran it very briefly. I think on a system. Um, I was a, it was an interesting project. Um, my, my personal point of view on this is that peer to and this is maybe a little controversial is that peer to peer on the whole system level is not sufficiently reliable to run these systems. Um, and I know Philip is interested. In, I think again, I think I think thing I heard from his talk the other day is that he was interested in that approach to actually do these systems. I personally think that's super difficult. I I think it's difficult enough to get a reliable server running as we have seen today, let alone peer to peer, which requires cooperation between nodes, which are very different network characteristics and other kinds of problems. If we talk about peer to peer between servers, that's actually a bit different. That's actually what we kind of do in OpenSIM with, with Hypergrid today. That is peer to peer between servers, but kind of peer to peer between, uh, Open Cobalt was super interesting because my understanding of it was that every Every node, kind of if you're running your viewer, you're effectively in a copy of the entire environment. You're not only seeing the messages from the, you're not seeing messages from the server about what's there. You are the server. You're kind of like replicating the environment everywhere. And I personally think that was really interesting, but I also think it had huge technical challenges in a, in a network of many different qualities of network of, of, of sorry, network and CPU and memory and all the, all the rest of it. So it's really interesting, but I, I don't think your project, I think the project has, terminally stalled from what I know of it. And I think it's very interesting. And I, I think the architecture we need actually has to be somewhat different from what we have today. I think there, there are a lot of, Hypergrid is really interesting, but it does have a lot of issues in terms of, you know, security, in terms of performance, in terms of reliability. It's not at all a simple thing. And I, I, think, I think there's a scope for actually doing much more stuff directly from the viewer and to actually get to a point where you can, like, like your web browser, you can take your viewer and go between environments without having to have the cooperation of those environments. I mean, web servers don't need to cooperate to, for you to go from one link to another. And I think the same way, more stuff has to kind of move viewer side in terms of where you maintain your inventory and some of the other stuff to actually do that. But that is kind of like a, a huge future thing. So uh, Cassie asked this question, I hope I'm pronouncing your name correctly, I'm always awful with names, is that, um, so question, many opportunities to introduce VW to people slash clients crashes uh, when we find out it doesn't run in the browser. Any chance of that happening, uh, e.g. Unity 3D? So I'm assuming you're talking about uh, a client that runs in the browser and rather than have to install this separate um, viewer system. So that's also a very um, interesting question. Um, I think you're you're definitely right in that this stuff has to be more accessible. Um, yeah, the single point is also interesting. It has to be more accessible. We know, I mean, of course, at the moment it's difficult to see through some of the reliability issues we have. I mean, you, to get you know, we've had a problem here today, and uh, you know, I don't hide that that we're we're still talking, you know, early software, um, and it can be difficult at times. Um, but also, there is a big. I, so people disagree with me on this. Um, 
some people disagree that I think viewers are enormously difficult to use. Um, no disrespect to the people who program them, but we're talking about really highly technical systems. It is kind of quite difficult for me to see because, of course, I'm, I'm very technical myself. I've worked with these systems for so long. I'm kind of used to the way they work. But I can, you know, I, I do think it's very difficult. And I think having a more, and also installing the client is an issue. I don't know if it's necessarily a huge issue, but it's inevitable that kind of a, um, a web-based stuff, a web-based client would make things easier. I think there are challenges associated with that in terms of, um, you know, do you want anybody kind of coming up without any pre-existing identity coming in and, and, and being able to go anywhere? It's, it's kind of an odd thing having a, almost if, if the viewers should be more like a browser, it would almost be like having a browser within a browser, um, which would be a COD kind of thing. So I don't know. The problem with the web stuff is that it's very promising, but the performance of WebGL is still much worse than a native client. There are some impressive things you can do in terms of games in WebGL, and I know we've seen them, and I know some other stuff is coming along. Um, but it's still the performance. Some people are very pessimistic about the performance on there. And I, I personally think it will get better, but it's still a long way behind. When you try and do an environment as complicated as this, which is general purpose, it's not optimized um, to the nth degree. Um, the performance is very low. Unity 3D uh, as a plugin is is very interesting, but again, I don't know. That's then you get back to the plugin barrier where people say we, we don't install a plugin to actually look at stuff, and maybe that's better than maybe that's better than uh, than installing a whole different client. But it's still a barrier. I I kind of don't know the answer to this. I think I agree that it needs to be easier, but I I don't fully know how we get there, and that's again an area that needs experimentation. So I think. Uh, Oh, right. Okay. I think that's it. Uh, Letty? Yes. Yes. Thank you so much, Justin. Uh, I appreciate you plodding through. I think we did an excellent job here with our backup on the live stream. Uh, everyone, please help me, um, you know, uh, thank Justin for his being here today. Thank you so much. Oh, well, thank you. Uh, thank you, everybody, for listening. I hope that was, uh, I hope that was worth the time. And thank you very much for bearing through the problems we've had. Uh, ideally, we'd have Hopefully we can get the sim restarted at some point because I think we've probably just got a, a, a slightly uh, an issue on the back end, but I don't have direct access to anything, right? and I don't have God powers to do that. So, but thank you very much for listening, everybody for listening, and thanks for uh, thanks for sticking with it. <laughs>